Hi, welcome to Exploring the Legion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and today we're going to be talking about Occupy and the One Percent's dilemma about the myth of free will. This is going to be a cool show. Um, basically, we're going through a very historic time right now. You know, this spring through the summer and fall, I think. Um, Basically, there should be um, there should be a global revolution. A uh, global revolution is expected. It's uh, you know the under the auspices of Occupy here in the United States and across Europe. But this is what started in um, the Middle East last year, last January, in Tunisia. Now it's spread throughout the world, and it's basically um, the uh, the people. You know, the vast majority of people, the 99 percent, just finally demanding from the 1% um, <clears throat> that they return the inordinate power and wealth that they've wrongly, criminally accumulated over the decades. Um, so <clears throat> now, so you've got the 99% <clears throat> basically um, going through a process of just, you know, it's, it's a political revolution and God willing will be a, a peaceful, you know, revolution. Um, not like what happened in Libya, but but it's going to be consuming the you know the spring, summer, and into the fall. And by the fall, you know, this country actually may not be <clears throat> the way it is now. In other words, our political system, our paradigm of of you know political parties and, and senators and and all that stuff, it just may not exist. That's the um, that's the time we're living in, and <clears throat> you know this this issue of human will is central to this, is central to this, because like <clears throat> what happens is when, um, when we believe in free will, we, we blame ourselves and we take credit for things. You know, what happens is like, um, and that's, you know, if you've seen the shows, you, you understand that. But and when, you, when we overcome the belief in free will, in other words, one of the, one of the main values of our overcoming the belief in free will is that um, <clears throat> we no longer have any reason, any rationale to blame others for anything, you know, and that is a godsend. And when you think of like, from the one percent's perspective, you've got ninety-nine percent. You've got a lot of people just angry with them, and um, and um, whether it will ultimately mean that a lot of them will lose their homes, their giant mansions, and they're like. 10 cars or whatever, um, or whether it'll mean much more than that, you know, who knows? But the idea is like, under a free will perspective, you have people that are kind of like holding the 1% responsible, you know, because of their own free will, they just like, they, they took advantage of people. They, um, they instituted unfair, discriminatory, um, oppressive, policies that, that benefited them, you know, and um, to a great extent now threatens us all. Um, so, so with this, you know, all right, I'm not going to get into, um, <clears throat> I may get into why free will is an illusion, you know, at the end of the show, but for this, because I, I tend to like to do this, this on each show, but for this show, I just want to stay with this topic um, in the beginning to try to explain it. So now the dilemma <clears throat> is that, um, all right, so if you're part of the 1%, you say to yourself, hey, wait a minute, if everybody um, gets over the illusion of free will, fine, they, um, they might have to take um, you know, my power and my money, but, but if that's a safer kind of proposition than, than if people continue to believe in free will, which will mean that they will blame me personally, that they will you know, just like consider me a horrible person and maybe wish to punish me. Okay, so that's... That's like, that's the upside of losing this illusion of free will for the one percent. Um, <clears throat> they're not to blame, you know. <clears throat> again, um, it's not sustainable for them to continue to hold the power and money they have, but but they're not to blame, and that's important. But the other side, and the dilemma comes that it's not just about them. In other words. Um, when we talk about the ramifications, the implications of not having a free will, one of them is, is just not being able to blame others, you know, or ourselves. 
But another one that's just as important and just as central to this, you know, it's not like as if it doesn't exist. If you can't blame anyone for anything because no one has a free will, fundamentally, you can't credit anyone for anything either. And so this goes, this works against the 1%, you know, richest in the world in, in two ways. Um, one, if if it makes no sense now to credit anyone with anything, you know, we're all puppets, we're all robots, we don't author anything, then um, that claim to, I deserve this, I worked really hard, I, I did this and this and this to accumulate this wealth, to accumulate this power, that, all that, it, it evaporates. That, that rationale evaporates. It no longer has any um, logical cogency. If free will is an illusion, no. Yeah, you worked for it, but it wasn't up to you. So what happens also is that, um, well, one, that provides the Occupy Revolution 99% a fundamental principle upon which to distribute the wealth. Because again, um, the problem we have now is that the top 1% have accumulated so much wealth and so much power, and you know, distribute the power also, that it's just like, it's become a danger to everyone. So now we have a rationale, you know, a, a logical, scientific, fundamental rationale for saying to the 1%, wait a minute, um, no, there's not, you know, that reason that you deserve it, you know, because of your own free will, you, you did this work, it no longer holds water, it no longer stands the test of reason. But, all right, it goes a bit further though, um, with the 1%, it's something that we also, have, as a society, as a world, have to also take into account. Um, right, no, I want to stay with this a bit longer. All right, so what happens is like, so no free will, no credit taking, no, no blaming, no credit taking, meaning that the principle for, for, inort, for anyone making a million dollars while somebody's making, you know, you know, some people make, my God, um, $10 million a year, uh, um, a hundred million dollars a year, you know, sometimes a billion dollars a year. I mean, the rational out for that completely evaporates when, when you consider that, um, you know, somebody's making, what, two dollars a day? It, it no longer, basically what I'm trying to say, and it's difficult, is we're kind of like conditioned into this capitalist kind of like a mindset that like to say things contrary in the past, you know, I guess before, before this collapse of 2008, it would have been kind of like sacrilegious, but you know, everybody knows the truth that now that capitalism is really um, endangering our, um, our future. So now we can say that, yeah, um, basically this, this rationale, this free will illusion-based rationale for rewarding many people, much more so than, than others, for things that nobody had any choice but what to do or not not do, um, it no longer makes sense. And so, um, so what happens is like one of the goals of the Occupy movement will be to re redistribute the wealth, and that will mean redistributing salaries. That you know you can you can no longer justify according to reward and punishment one person making more than another for anything. You might want to justify it in terms of human nature that like, for example, if you want somebody to be a, um, let's say, a trained neurosurgeon and, you know, they have to go through um, a lot of training to do that, years, whatever, um, we might, we would be wise, I think, to, to invest, you know, I guess, the, the funds to train our physicians, to train our experts, to train people. but. Again, that doesn't um, necessarily mean that we're going to reward them financially, inordinately, above what's required for their training. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that, that could go across the board, not just through, you know, with physicians, but just uh, throughout the economy. Um, okay. I want to, um, let's see. All right, so the 1% now has this dilemma. Um, corporations and the 1% are pretty much synonymous in, in, you know, in this sense. You know, the 1% richest people in the world are generally 
the the people who are on the boards of directors and who run you know who are the CEOs of the major corporations and all that that and um, they um, <coughs> you know they haven't really addressed this issue of of, of human will and um, and I think one reason is because I think they they get it you know the, they may not be the most good people in a lot of ways, the one percent, but they're smart. And and they they understand that yeah, that if you can't if if personal accountability no longer makes sense, <clears throat> their whole lifestyle, you know, um the whole uh, the whole premise for the, the rewards that they have sought and you know accumulated and all, it, it just it, it vanishes. Vanishes. Um, but but see the idea is like all right. So the one percent of the corporations have a have a choice now, and this is the dilemma I'm trying to like you know express. They can either continue to ignore the fact that um, free will is an illusion, as they have, because that has maintained their their quote unquote right to inordinate power and wealth. Or they can um, they can help the world to um, to disavow ourselves of this this illusion, this just very very harmful myth. And um, to the extent they do that, I hope they do that. I hope they're you know I hope I hope the universe compels them to do that because again it's not up to them. Um, because what happens is to the extent. And we started out with this before, but but it, it's important to the extent um, the corporations choose to just like ignore this this scientific advance, this leap in evolution, of, you know, going to from a you know completely erroneous, mistaken perspective of reality to to a reality that you know perspective makes sense. To the extent that they ignore that, they risk you know come July, August, September a much harsher, a much more punitive reaction from the 99%. In other words, if you're the 1%, you want the 99% going after you, saying to themselves or knowing, well, it's not their fault, but we, you can't have your power and wealth anymore the way you do. You want, you'd prefer that than the 99% saying, well, we want your power and wealth because that's the way it has to be, and you're evil because of all you've done. See, that's the dilemma. Um, I would guess that the corporations, the 1%, will, um, I would hope, that they see the reason in it. You know, cause, uh, and, and, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting how these two kinds of very revolutionary, um, revolutionary just, occurrences are happening just like at the same time pretty much. I mean you have a time in history where um, where now over the, all over the world, I mean before the revolution was um, against monarchies, you had these like you know kings, queens throughout the world that they felt they had some kind of God ordained um, divinity, some you know God ordained authority over everyone else. And so you had you know the American Revolution, the French Revolution, you had the Russian Revolution, you know, you just had various revolutions just taking the power from the monarch monarchy, from this kind of like established feudalist, you know, socioeconomic system. But then what happened was that that power wasn't distributed, that money and power wasn't distributed equally. It, it you know, accumulated. And um, I don't to to go through some American history in this because I think it's important. Um, the Occupy Global Revolution is a is you talk about causality, cause and effect. It's a direct causal result of the 2008 economic meltdown, which is the result of you know the um, the very selfish, greedy policies of of the the one percent. You know, just ignoring uh, these economic um, threats that that we've been facing you know for for decades. Um, but to the extent. To the extent that we um, do, we, all right. Yeah, the the I'm, I'm trying to. 
with the, with the with the Occupy Revolution happening now, um, it's it's actually it makes it much more likely that that the world will much more quickly or soon um, come to understand the, the the causal and conscious nature of our will. Um, the one percent has that dilemma. They no longer can say to ourselves to themselves. Um, you know, we can, we can ignore this um, <clears throat> topic. We don't have to talk about it because now if they ignore this topic, again, you know, come um, September, October, the, the revolution against them might become destructive, physically destructive, against their property, against their persons. Who knows? That's the thing. It's, a very, it's, it's like nobody knows. You know, it's never happened before in the world. So, so as a matter of... Um, safety, prudence, wisdom, you know, just um, erring on the side of caution, you would hope and expect that corporations who, um, who've in the past, you know, ignored or, um, or confused the public about the nature of human will will now see it's to their benefit to, um, to disavow, you know, humanity of that, you know, to help disavow us of that myth. Um, now, it's interesting because this is about the 1%, the richest, most powerful 1% in the world. But it also has to do with, with religions who are all, that are also very powerful. And, uh, you know, I've done shows on this. It's actually probably better for religions to, um, to adopt this, this causal world perspective because, like, to the extent that... Um, everybody understands that um, free will is an illusion, that nobody's to blame or nobody's accountable for anything, then you don't even have to forgive. You know, religion is a lot about compassion and forgiveness, but, you know, there being no free will means there's nothing ever to forgive in, a, in anyone fundamentally, which is pretty cool. Um, all right. I think, I think I've covered this Enough. I mean, I'm, um, I may just talk extemporaneous. Let me go into the reasons now um, why free will is impossible. You know, um, make so it makes more sense. Okay. Um, basically, there is a principle in reality. <coughs> there, there, there's an there's a, an occurrence in reality called change. Okay. Let's go right from the the very fundamental. Um, aspect of all this. There's the most fundamental process in the universe is change. Okay? Without change, nothing would happen. Everything would be frozen. Okay? That, that means change is, and, and when I say change in a physical sense, all it means is like matter, a particle, a wave particle, however you want to define it, being at what, one place at one moment in time and that and in another moment in time, whether it's immediately subsequent to it or further down the line, it's going to be in a different moment, a, a place in time. All right, that's change. Change is like the things don't stay the way they are. There's motion. Okay, so it's basically matter moving through space in time. Okay, so, so think about it. Um, Without causality, there's no change. In other words, causality is the process that explains change. In other words, like things change because they're caused to change. They don't just change on their own. There has to be something that changes them. All right, so you've got this principle of causality, and it applies to the whole universe. You know, in other words, the state of the universe at this moment is completely causing the state of the universe at the subsequent moment, which is completely causing the state of the, uh, the universe at the subsequent moment. All right, it, in, it, it involves the entire universe. So, and that's what makes free will impossible, because, you know, we can go back from, let's say, the Big Bang to the present, seeing that chain of cause and effect with the states of the universe at every moment, but we can also, like, go back in time from any decision we make, and that's what renders free will impossible, because let, we make any decision, any kind of choice, any thought. All we have to ask ourselves is like, well, does it have a cause? And obviously the answer is yes. And, and the most comprehensive general cause is the state of the universe prior to whatever. 
but you ask yourself, you know, once you ask yourself, does what we do have a cause, and then you recognize that everything has a cause, then you clearly understand that anything we do has a cause, which has a cause, which has a cause, which ultimately renders the causes or the cause for what we do completely not in our, um, <laughs> in our I'm not sure, um, in our control. I'm going to try this again. You, you got the causality. I want, I want to work with the unconscious now. Um, okay, this is the unconscious explanation of why free will is impossible. Um, when we make a decision, we have to base it on something. If we didn't base our decision on something, it would be arbitrary, it would be random, and that's, not, that's certainly not what we mean when we say we have a free will, when we say our, our decisions are up to us. You know, so like, so a random decision would, would, wouldn't give us free will. But, um, so what happens is, yeah, if we have a, a decision we're making, it has to be based on on something, on reasons, on causes, or whatever. Information, on data, you know, past experiences, learning. Um, and so what happens, like, you know, our mind, if, if, you, if you recognize your conscious mind is, like, right now, if you're listening to this, watching this, your conscious mind is aware of what you're watching and listening to. It's not aware of everything in your unconscious. My mind, my conscious mind is aware of what I'm saying, what I'm seeing right now. It's not aware of everything in my conscious, in, in my mind, upon which I might make a decision. Because think about it. Also, with consciousness, you can only be aware of maybe one or a few things at a certain time. And so think about it. If, if you've got to make a decision um, that, that has maybe a multitude of factors, you know, subtle... Um, considerations that, that come into play with this. Think about it. If, if these considerations cannot be in your conscious mind, because your conscious mind can only focus on one or a couple at a time, they have to be in your unconscious mind. All right, so, now, that means that you're, you're making a decision based on stuff that's in your unconscious mind. But the thing is that you're not aware of what's in your unconscious mind, so you have a part of your mind that you're not aware of at all, storing all of the data upon which you're going to make your decision, okay? And that, that should tell you that free will is an illusion. An illusion. That's, that should give you an understanding of why free will is, is, um, is a myth, because we're not, you know, we don't control the unconscious. And it, 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 goes, it goes beyond just the data for our every decision being in the unconscious. The other part of this is that, like, if our conscious mind can't access the information upon which to make whatever decision it wants to make, the only part of the mind that can access that information is the unconscious. Okay, so you have both the data and the processing of every decision we make being in the unconscious, which by definition and by experience, by experimentation, we know is not um, subject to, con to control, to real-time control by our conscious mind. Again, our conscious mind doesn't even know it's there. So if that part of our mind is making the decision, you know, and has the... the that's going to tell you. You know, it's a part of our mind that we're not in control of. We're not aware of it. It's, we can't freely will what we can't um, control. All right. That, um, I think that, that I think should explain why, you know, why basically free will is impossible. It's not like the, the philosophers just haven't figured out a way to save it. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, it's just impossible. All right. We've got three minutes left. Um, back to the, the 1%. We are going through a, a monumental, world-changing time. And, um, <clears throat> and it's important that, that the 1% get this right. It's important that the 1% understand that it's to their benefit as well as everyone else's that they um, begin to acknowledge and promote this 
this basic nature of our human will. You know, again, they, they may have had personal business reasons to, um, to not delve into this in the past, but those reasons aren't there anymore. You know, again, as, as we go into these, ne these next months, the, uh, the 1% are going to be held increasingly accountable. That's the thing. You got free will, you have to hold them accountable. They have did a lot wrong. They destroyed our economy. They've killed a lot of people. You know, they've tortured a lot of animals. So it's, it's their choice now. And, you know, it's not up to them. God willing, fate willing, um, they will be compelled to help our world understand relatively soon that, that free will is an illusion for their benefit, you know, as well as for the benefit of everyone else. You know, to, to ensure that the Occupy revolution of the 99% go as peacefully and with as little acrimony as possible. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense. Okay, and again, you know, um, whether the 1% does that or not, certainly I can't blame them or, or hold, hold them accountable. I know they don't have a free will. That's where we get back to this idea of hope. We hope. That, um, that they make the right decision for, for everyone. And again, we're, we're basically hoping that the universe <laughs> has, has, um, has compelled them to, um, to understand the significance of this question and its importance to their lives personally. All right, we're wrapping down. Have less than a minute. Every Wednesday night, um, we do a show in Manhattan called The Myth of Free Will Live Debate Show. It's a live show. You can call in Wednesdays at 11 p.m. Check out Manhattan Neighborhood Network, Channel 56, and it's also on the Internet. The, the station just streams the shows live, so if you don't, don't live in Manhattan, you know, just, you can catch it anywhere in the world. Okay, and, and we're here like every Thursday night, 9 p.m. This is episode number 57. Um, we're going to keep doing this, universe willing, until everybody gets this. All right, I, um, I guess I'm done for today. I hope everybody's having a great day, and I will see you next week. Thanks.